All right, well, welcome everybody to this very special evening uh, in the ANZOG uh, calendar. I'm Gary Banks, I'm uh, Dean of ANZOG, um, and it's a really uh, a great pleasure uh, to have you here uh, for the Patterson Oration, a very special event uh, in memory of a very uh, special man, um, but also combined with the awards for uh, the Executive Master of Public Administration. And I think those two things go together just so well. Um, I think John Patterson uh, was a great supporter of young talent. And as his wife Mary has said, and his daughter Sophie is also here, welcome both of you. Um, he was also an early pioneer in supporting talented women. And he would be very pleased, I think, to see uh, how many talented women are coming through the ANZOG uh, programs and indeed are, are here tonight. So uh, before... Uh, Getting on to proceedings, I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, on behalf of ANZOG and all of us here, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation uh, on whose uh, ancestral land uh, we're meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Tomorrow, uh, those of you who are coming to the conference and who'll be there first thing, you'll, you'll have the wonderful experience of having a welcome to country by Matthew Doyle. Um, those of you who've seen Matthew will know that not only does he give a verbal welcome to country, a fairly traditional style, but he's also a fantastic didgeridoo player. And we'll, you'll experience both of those phenomena, so it's a great incentive to get, uh, get your seats early uh, tomorrow. Well, the Patterson Oration was established by Anzog in 2003 to recognise and commemorate the distinguished contribution of Dr John Patterson AO to public administration and public sector reform in Australia. Uh, John Patterson was one of Australia's most eminent and highly regarded public servants. He assisted governments at state and national levels by developing practical solutions to long-standing problems and bringing management expertise to improve delivery of public services. He had a very strong focus, not just on policy design, but also you know, implementation, where often things uh, fall down. Just to mention uh, a few highlights uh, of his career, um, in 1982, as head of the Hunter District Water Board, uh, Dr Patterson introduced a pioneering user pay scheme to manage the costs and use of water, replacing traditional rates. This was really the beginning of a reform which is still ongoing uh, in Australia and the insights that John had in those very early days are still, are still highly relevant to the ongoing reform task. Uh, about a decade later, in 1993, he introduced the case mix funding system for public hospitals uh, in Victoria, uh, a system that became a model for other states uh, and nationally. And he was also a very powerful uh, early voice for water a, a wider reform of, of health. Uh, John at one stage produced a slide presentation uh, which is still famous uh, and still circulating uh, from those early days talking about the needs uh, and opportunities for reform in health. Uh, from 1996 to 2000 he was head of the Department of Infrastructure in Victoria and um, brought to that role uh, his customary uh, uh, enlightened approach and rigorous approach um, one that hadn't been seen much previous to then and some would argue hasn't been seen all that much since, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but certainly John Patterson you know, brought a new rigour to what is a very important area of, of public policy and one that's tended to be captured a bit by the politics. In subsequent years uh, before his death in 2003, he lectured as a profes professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne. He worked as a consultant on the health sector and communications technology, as an advisor on water reform, and as a part-time associate commissioner for the Productivity uh, Commission uh, when I was its chairman. John Patterson was widely considered as one of the most talented and effective public servants of his time. He was also an inspiration and mentor for others, uh, and as I said, an acknowledged champion uh, of women in the workplace. So, uh, as I said, we're, we're pleased to have uh, John's wife, Mary, and daughter, uh, Sophie, here with us tonight. We're also very grateful to Telstra, uh, and T Telstra's representative, Tony Warren, uh, will say a few words later. 
and we're particularly grateful uh, to Peter Shergold uh, uh, for, being the uh, for being the Patterson orator uh, for tonight. We're just saying, Peter and I, that there's something special about being an orator. It, it, it takes you to a whole extra level and, and, and you don't have to put up with a Q&A, you know? Uh, I said that. Uh, Peter, Peter wouldn't care about a Q&A. So uh, Professor Peter Shergold AC is Chancellor of Western uh, Sydney University. He's had a distinguished uh, career within the Australian Public Service and Academia and he continues to make important contributions to public life. Following a number of years at the University of New South Wales, which he joined on migrating to Australia from the UK, and you can still hear that English accent a bit, uh, Peter, he joined the Commonwealth Public Service in 1987, and he subsequently headed a range of Commonwealth agencies, including Comcare, ATSIC, uh, and the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. Uh, in 2003, Peter was appointed Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, where he remained until retiring from the Australian Public Service in 2008. Uh, I said retiring from the Australian Public Service because Peter's been busier than ever since then. He has what he describes as a portfolio career, serving on the boards of AMP, uh, Core Chambers, um, Westgarth and Quintessence Labs. He chairs Opal Aged Care, he also remains active in public administration and he's the Coordinator General for the Refugee Resettlement in New South Wales. He chairs the Higher Education Standards Panel, the New South Wales Public Service Commission Advisory Board and the National Centre for Vocational Education Research. And it doesn't stop there. Peter's uh, led a number of inquiries and reviews on issues of national importance, including his task group on emissions trading for the Howard Government, remember that? Uh, when we're all very hopeful. Um, and his recent report on the implementation of large public programs, titled very appropriately, Learning from Failure. Not least of all, uh, Peter Shergold's a fellow of ANZOG, to which he's made a significant uh, contribution since its inception, including as a board member and chair, and as a, pr a presenter in various programs. Um, I know whenever I invite Peter to do something, um, he'll always do his best uh, to make it. Um, but of course, he's a very busy man and therefore we're delighted that he can be here tonight. He was made a member of the Order of Australia in 96. He was awarded the Centenary Medal in 2003. And in 2007, he received Australia's highest award, the Companion of the Order of Australia for service to the community as a public sector leader. It's an honour to have uh, Peter Shergold give the Patterson oration tonight. And I ask you please to welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Well, I am delighted to have been honoured with the unexpected opportunity to give this year's Patterson oration. And I am delighted to do so in the presence of Mary and Sophie. As you've heard, John Patterson was a talented public servant. He was also an amazing individual. The first time I met John, I was immediately struck by his physical appearance, for John had been born with diastrophic dwarfism. I think I noticed his stature and gait for about the first 30 seconds. After all that, all I could ever focus on was his formidable, challenging mind. John didn't just talk. He debated fiercely, even with himself. In his commanding presence, one witnessed the energy of a person with a passion for life and a burning commitment to the vocation of public administration. He was a true provocateur. He employed his sharp intellect, sharper tongue and biting humour to challenge many of the reassuring verities that foster public service complacency. John died too young in 2003. I became the chair of the Australia New Zealand School of Government three years later. In my informed view, it was John Patterson who was the intellectual progenitor of ANZOG. Certainly it was John who persuaded me in the late 1990s of the need for a trans-Tasman organisation that could teach, research 
and advocate. I was quickly seized by John's vision of a new school of thought that could inspire public servants to appreciate the value of an independent, non-partisan public service for democratic governance, but also help keep them reimagining how that purpose could best adapt to a changing world. The oration that acts as a memorial to John Patterson's contribution has attracted many distinguished speakers. Prime Ministers John Howard, Helen Clark, John Key and Kevin Rudd have each used this prestigious platform to reflect on public service. As the distinguished jurist Michael Kirby said in his address in 2010, if I could not attain the Prime Ministerial Office by my achievements, I could at least secure the next best thing, delivering the address to Anzog. <laughs> that unworthy sentiment has led me to reflect on how the present Australian Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, might have addressed this gathering if he had enjoyed the opportunity to attend this afternoon. There are clues. Just before the writs of election were issued in May, the PM spoke to a Nipper gathering in Canberra. I wasn't there, but I've read the speech and noted the major issues on which it concentrated. The desirability of gender diversity in public service leadership, the significance of institutional experience and memory, and almost inevitably, the far-reaching possibilities of digital engagement with citizens. I've also viewed the celebratory photos from the occasion. The Prime Minister looking to the upcoming election with quiet assurance, surrounded by APS eminences publicly flaunting their covert power as assured and authoritative leaders. Of course, looks can be deceiving. According to the online media of record, the Mandarin, <laughs> Turnbull unsurprisingly endorsed former Mandarin Peter Shergold's vision of an adaptive government and also agreed with Shergold's argument that government messaging needs to change. Well, I'm certain that is not what the PM thought he was doing, nor in truth was he. I suspect that the presumptuous conflation of Shergoldian and Turnbullian ideas <laughs> came about because just a fortnight previously, I had spoken to a similar IPA audience in the same venue. I used that occasion to talk about the report that I had written for the Commonwealth Government, Learning from Failure, colon. Colons are very important in academic life. Colon. How large government policy initiatives have gone so badly wrong in the past and how the chances of success in the future can be improved. Well, that Wildavsky-like subtitle was almost as long as the report's protracted gestation. I was handed the commission on Christmas Eve 2015 presented my conclusions to the Abbott government in August 2015, and eventually saw them made public by the Turnbull government five months later, at the end of February 2016. The release of the report, I surmise, represents at least a willingness to have my ideas debated, if not giving a ringing endorsement. For that small mercy, I am grateful. I do know that the PM and I are in strong agreement on at least one fundamental aspect of the Westminster system, namely the central role that Cabinet should play as a collective forum for vigorously discussing, challenging, amending, and on occasion rejecting public policy proposals. This certainly is one of the key lessons I drew from my review 
of the disastrous design and implementation of the home insulation program. I was left in no doubt that failed cabinet processes contributed mightily to poor decision making. Based on his own experience, the importance of a well-functioning and collegiate cabinet is one to which the PM subscribes and frequently espouses. At the 2013 Sir John Monash oration presented by Malcolm Turnbull, he referred approvingly to an article I had recently written on the comparative strength of Australia's cabinet system. He extolled the need for prime ministers to use that space to temper their impatience, finding wisdom in Proverbs 11. Where no council is, the people fall, but in the multitude of councillors there is safety. It's at least, well, possible that the PM might have sympathy for the concept of adaptive governance, which is the underlying theme of my address this evening. But although my speech, my oration, might seek to convey some of the innovative impulse that reassures the PM that our nation can successfully address contemporary challenges, this is most assuredly not a speech he would have given had he been here, nor is it the speech which I very much hope the PM will present to Anzog in the future. Let me nevertheless take the expressed sentiments of Malcolm Turnbull as the introductory text for tonight's oration. Because, as he told that Ipper luncheon, I want to see public servants who are filled with curiosity and a desire to make a difference. Well, that too is my ambition. I take great pride in the late 19th century Westminster tradition of permanent public service, in which administrators of professional integrity, selected on merit, serve successive dem democratically elected governments with equal commitment. I believe it's a vocation, and not a job. And yet, for the last quarter of a century, within and without the Australian Public Service, I have been intrigued by whether the traditional values of a permanent apolitical public administration can be successfully adapted to the changing circumstances of the early 21st century. Always, I have sought to make a difference. From the beginning of my personal journey as founding director of the Office of Multicultural Affairs way back in 1988, to my most recent role as New South Wales Coordinator General for Refugee Resettlement. As I've travelled through the APS way stations of situational authority on that long voyage of discovery, I've been motivated by the desire to contribute to the public good. Sometimes, although rather less frequently than I would have hoped, I've been successful. During that time, much has changed for the better in public administration. Australian public services have altered how they go about their business. Public infrastructure is increasingly built on the basis of private-public partnerships. Much of the frontline work that public servants used to undertake has been outsourced to organisations in the business and community sectors. This commissioning of service delivery has created greater diversity and contestability in the delivery of government programmes. More recently, a philosophy of consumer direction has sought to provide recipients of government support with more choice. Public programmes are being implemented with a stronger commitment to service, transacted both face-to-face -face and through information technology. It's important to recognise that citizens, 
citizens with their balance of rights and responsibilities are far more than customers. But the services they receive from government should certainly be every bit as accessible and valued as the services that they purchase directly from the private market. The positive news is that public services themselves have shown a remarkable capacity to assess their own need to improve, generally without the instigation and even sometimes without the full authority of the governments that they serve. The management consultancy language of leadership development, performance management, organisational capacity, workforce capability, strategic direction and human-centred design is now commonplace. Every jurisdiction in Australia, in its own manner and with varying degrees of commitment, has embraced reform agendas over recent decades. The former Australian Public Service Commissioner Steve Sedgwick was probably correct in his belief that there's been a formal review of the APS about once every decade. At the very least, public services deserve to be commended for their resilience in the face of austerity and adversity. And yet, and yet I don't think it's enough. No doubt I see through a glass darkly, but to my imperfect vision, bold public sector innovations are too often begun only to shipwrecks on the reefs of inadequate foresight, unsustained implementation, cautionary risk aversion, or failure of imagination. In a digitally connected world, in which the movement of capital, labour and products has become freer, and in which the movement of ideas, good, bad and decidedly ugly, is unrestricted, Public services need to adapt in innovative ways. They need to think global, but act local in responding to changing circumstances. They need to become driving forces for public good, rather than imposing a deadweight burden of bureaucratic regulation on the creation of economic well-being and social benefit. Of course, I want to see progressive enhancement in the efficiency and effectiveness of public administration. But my ambitions, against which I measure success, are grander. I wish for an improved civil service, but more fundamentally, I hope it can make a more profound contribution to the revitalisation of a civil society. Such then were my musings last year as I contemplated the deeper significance of the manner in which government initiatives can go so badly wrong. I sought to imagine a different public service, faithful to the old traditions, but responsive to the emerging challenges of a new world. The term I coined was adaptive government. In retrospect, I think that adaptive governance is more accurate, for it depends not just on a new approach to political leadership, but on a different expression of public service. Honesty compels me to confess, however, that any claim to ownership of the concept of adaptive government is true only in a, well, public service sort of way. I was fortunate to have a small but enthusiastic group working with me as I drafted the Learning from Failure report. As I wrestled to articulate disparate and ill-formed ideas into a coherent body of thought, it was one of that team who introduced me to the term. She had, perhaps, discovered it during her research. She immediately recognised that it captured well the concept of a more flexible and decisive public service 
able to respond quickly to governments as they sought to change strategic policy direction and or deal expeditiously with immediate and often unanticipated crises. I stole her idea with good grace. In academic circles, that form of intellectual theft is characterised as plagiarism. In public service, it's known as hierarchy. <laughs> if ideas turn out well, they are developed by administrative service officers, refined by senior executives, burnished by the secretary, and publicly announced by the minister. If they go wrong, as happened so disastrously with the installation of pink bats, responsibility is quickly devolved down the line once again. But I digress. Once alerted to the term, I embraced it wholeheartedly. It seemed to me to capture the suite of structural and cultural approaches that a government, indeed a society, should expect of its public service agencies. It provided a bridge to many of the reforms that I have championed in recent years, such as commissioning service delivery on the basis of selecting the most effective distribution channel, building cross-sectoral collaboration, co-designing programs, incorporating social impact funding, and empowering citizens by providing them with choice in a contestable public economy. The term incorporates, too, the need to address the failures that had become evident during my inquiry, such as the inability to assess and manage risk effectively, to learn from experience, or to manage major projects in a manner that could respond to changing circumstances. So, what are the characteristics of adaptive governance? The first element that a public service requires is organisational flexibility. The way to do this is to agree with government ministers the ends that they seek, the budget that they are willing to make available, um, the time frame that they have in mind, and their appetite for risking political capital in pursuit of their aspirations. Having established the goals to be pursued, success should be measured against those outcome benchmarks, rather than judged by the processes employed to achieve them. If it is decided that execution is to be commissioned to outside providers, then the primary task of the public servant should not be to manage their contracts, but rather to establish a partnership in which both parties subscribe to a common goal. Objectives need to be negotiated. The experience of the provider needs to be incorporated into the design of the programmes. And, a bold move this, public servants then need to get out of the way and give the third party agents the freedom to pursue agreed outcomes as they see best. Not all contracted providers should be expected to undertake their task in a similar manner. Indeed, they should be actively encouraged to do things differently, tailoring programs to the needs of particular places, communities or individuals. This will enable public servants to evaluate and appraise on a continuous basis those approaches which are most cost effective in adding public value. The pursuit of performance-based outcomes involves far more than the drafting of a contractual transaction. It requires the capacity of both parties to learn by doing on the basis of direct experience and to respond flexibly to changing circumstances. That exhortation to explore diverse approaches to the delivery of a government's objectives leads me to the second element of adaptivity, namely experimentation. Public servants should be authorised to undertake controlled trials 
on how best to deliver government ambitions, whether it is through regulating, behavioural nudging, providing payments, or delivering services directly or under contract. Demonstration projects undertaken in a controlled and systematic manner make it possible to trial different approaches. They depend on a culture of continuous learning. Innovative proposals can be started early, modified progressively, and on occasion fail quickly. Feedback can inform modification. Successes can be fine-tuned, scaled up, and rolled out more widely. Experimentation helps to achieve that most profound of strategic intents. Namely, in the words of the wonderful Peter Hennessy, the reconciliation of government intentions with possibilities. This approach, in which mistakes are recognised as the mother of invention, seems to have worked for some centuries with business entrepreneurs. The public sector needs to embrace a private sector truth, namely that if failing is unacceptable, learning is impossible. The sad fact is that most startups close down, but a few that don't transform the world. Even within large bureaucratically structured corporations, those people with the capacity to drive new approaches are extolled as intrapreneurs. Every organisation needs those individuals who can think outside the box. Certainly the not-for-profit sector is being transformed by just such social entrepreneurs, willing to explore new and financially sustainable ways of affecting community change. Contrastingly, I have to say, in the public sector, the value of experimentation and ethos of entrepreneurship are too often viewed with caution. Frequently in government, the announcement of a pilot study turns out to be simply a euphemistic excuse for the fact that insufficient funds have been provided for a larger program. Too rarely are demonstration projects embraced as a the best means of evaluating different approaches whilst managing the necessary risks of innovation. It's time to encourage and celebrate public entrepreneurship and for governments to authorise public servants to apply creativity to the design and the funding and the delivery of public policy. This willingness to accept that mistakes are an inevitable part of the process of public innovation brings us to consider a third element of adaptive government. Public services must learn to become more agile, not just in responding to immediate crises and changing circumstances, which are the daily staples of political life, but in planning and executing strategy for the longer term. They need to develop the ability to imagine new approaches and to learn continuously from testing in a systematic manner. That task calls for effective project management. Equally important, it requires evaluation to be recognised as an ongoing process, integral to modifying approaches on the run, rather than being regarded as an end-of-process sign-off. We have the auditor to look backwards. The evaluator, like the risk manager, should be firmly focused on the horizon ahead. We need a whole-of-government approach, not just to the coordination of planning, but to the sharing of failures as a means of building success. War stories can become the narrative of agility. Learning from failure can keep public servants on their toes. Finally, let us imagine what these qualities of adaptive governance require of public servants. In my view, the demonstration of flexibility, experimentation and agility calls for a new form of leadership based on collaboration rather than control. 
driven by the creation of partnership rather than the exercise of unequal power. Public servants will retain their position at the centre of democratic governance. I cannot envisage governance structures in which public servants do not retain the situational authority to collect revenues, provide policy advice, draft legislation, regulate on behalf of the state, and be held accountable for the delivery of payments and programs. Yet increasingly, they will be required to fulfil that stewardship role within a public economy that is at least in part designed, delivered, even funded by the private and community sectors. Public servants will also need to be increasingly responsive to citizen needs, not just through the ability in the digital age to create new forms of deliberative democracy. Public servants should be ceaselessly exploring new ways for their state to engage the citizenry in making individual and collective decisions in the public realm. The public should be perceived as participants rather than seen merely as taxpayers or beneficiaries. The fourth component of adaptive government then is for public servants to exhibit the leadership of facilitation. Institutionally, public servants need to have more porous boundaries so that talent and expertise can be brought in from the outside to work in the public interest and to allow public administrators to benefit from time in the private community or academic sectors. Individually, public servants need to work more closely with business and not-for-profit leaders and engage with advocacy organisations, think tanks and universities, ensuring that experience at all levels in all sectors can be harnessed to the design and execution of government policy. New government programmes need to be based not only on evidence, but, equally important, on experience. Public servants as facilitators need to ensure that they can incorporate and translate outside perspectives into their thinking. They are knowledge workers. They need to ensure that the ideas they place at the disposal of the government they serve are informed by the widest possible practical contact with the real world. On such a foundation, authenticity is built. Adaptive governance is at its heart the application of system theory to the wicked intricacies of public policy. It ensures that the approach to strategic intent can be continuously adapted to changing circumstance and learned experience. It enables government to be responsive in finding the most appropriate means to tackle problems for which there is no optimal or definitive solution. Through flexibility, experimentation, agility and facilitation, public services can pursue and assess a variety of approaches to delivering the goals of the state in ways which engage the active participation of its citizens. So, let me conclude. This is not the oration that the Prime Minister would have given. Yet it is entirely apposite to use his words as he launched the Digital Transformation Office to bring my address to an end. Government, Malcolm Turnbull said, has an obligation to shrug off the conservative shackles and innovate its own operations and lead by example to promote a flexible and nimble culture, one that values principles and framework over rigid rules that are more likely to stifle innovation than foster it. I'm happy to agree with that argument. To my ear, at least, it sounds like a testament to the need for adaptive government. Unsurprisingly, I'll happily endorse the Prime Minister's vision. Thank you.
Well, I think you'll agree with me that there couldn't have been a better introduction not only to our conference uh, and its theme about change and turbulence and, and managing it and triumphing over it, adapting to it, um, but also tonight, um, hopefully, uh, the, the award winners among the EMPA group will, will find extra inspiration uh, through Peter's words uh, as you pursue your own career. So, Peter, uh, there's nothing more I can add to that other than to say thank you very much and ask everyone to join me in thanking Peter Shergold. <laughs>